So it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here. We're kind of uh, in our hybrid mode, but um, very happy for that. So those of you here in the room can see you here on West 36th Street, um, and to acknowledge the, the Barn Graduate Center's life here on the uh, Manahata, the uh, ancestral land of Lenin, the Nape people, not the Hoping, and also that we are and would have been 150 years ago or more uh, just a stone's throw from Seneca Village, the village of free blacks and immigrant Irish that was uh, that flourished and then was buried in the making of uh, Central Park. And we're here today to um, welcome one of the spring's uh, visiting fellows at the Bard Graduate Center, Louisa Ruby, who is uh, an expert in the history of collecting, who was at the Frick for many years in their center for the history of collecting, um, an active scholar coming from the background of studying prints, most recently of uh, curating and publishing on Bruegel prints for our current exhibition uh, in uh, Belgium. And um, at the Bard Graduate Center this semester, she's actually engaging with a topic near and dear uh, to us, uh, kind of a blast from out of our past, uh, female collectors in 17th century New York uh, was the subject of an exhibition on Marguerite von Barak in 2009. And it's great to see the subject being returned to me for very much to have residents for your talk today. Those of you who are watching uh, can feel free to uh, send your questions in through the Q&A function, and we will uh, capture them uh, after the talk. Thanks very much, and welcome. Thank you, Peter, for that nice introduction, and thanks to everyone who's here and on Zoom uh, for taking the time out today. I know everyone's schedule is crazy these days. Um, and also a thanks to Bard in general for um, giving me the time and the space, um, both physically and mentally, to work on this topic, um, which is dear to my heart. Um, I began first in about 2005. Um, I proposed a paper for a conference at University of Denver that Joyce good friend hosted on the influence of anything Dutch on anything American. Um, and I was very steeped in early American portraiture at that point. And I am a, traditionally a scholar of Netherlandish art. And so um, I had realized that there was a kind of a connection. And I really tried to trace that connection between the Dutch art and the burgeoning American tradition here in this country. Um, in 2000, Eight, uh, the Center for the History of Collecting at the Frick proposed a, uh, a seminar, a, a, a symposium on collecting Dutch art in America. And I proposed a paper on collecting uh, Dutch art in colonial New York because I realized from doing the earlier work that there actually were quite a number of portraits that had made it over to these shores during the Dutch Golden Age, which made a lot of sense. The Dutch people didn't just forget their past and disappear and become new people when they came over here. Um, and I started wondering, well, what kind of objects might they have brought? What kind of paintings might they have been able to bring over in those early days? Um, so uh, just to go back a little bit to um, kind of have everyone who's less familiar with the colony of New Netherlands give a little history. Um, the New Netherlands ran roughly from present day New York City up to present day Albany and from Delaware up to Connecticut. This is a map from 1655. It's a, actually a later reprint. Um, in 1621, the Dutch uh, government chattered the, sorry, chartered the West India Company with the goal both of bringing order to economic activity in New Netherland and of challenging Spanish influence in the New World. The colony was intended to be profitable. It was a trading post primarily for beaver furs, which were sent back to the Netherlands and eventually made into the felt hats, so popular with Dutch burghers that you see in their portraits. The first actual settlers are generally accepted to have been arrived in 1624 and were predominantly Walloon refugees. Protestants from what is now the southern part of Belgium who had moved north to escape religious persecution from the Spanish. 
There's no indication that these early settlers brought over any luxury goods or paintings. Most were not very wealthy. Life was difficult in New Netherland. The land was cold, isolated, and there was a major threat from the Native Americans. Initially, settlers were not concerned with material wealth and luxury items such as paintings, but in building homes and securing food sources. The colony was not very well run in the first 20 years before Peter Stuyvesant arrived as director in 1647. The prior director, Willem Kieft, in particular, had been incompetent and devastated the colony with unnecessary wars with the Native Americans. Nonetheless, despite the relative instability of the colony, the importation of Dutch paintings is documented already in the early 1640s. In 1643, Jan Jebkins Schellinger, captain of the ship Hope, took with him part of his household effects consisting of paintings, silverwork, clothing, jewelry, and furniture to sell in New Netherland. In the same year, the estate inventory of Jonas Bronck, who owned the land we now call the Bronx, mentions 11 pictures. Peter Stuyvesant and his sister Anna brought over portraits of themselves and their common in-laws. This is Peter Stuyvesant's sister Anna and her husband. This was done before they came over and uh, actually um, the husband died before coming over, but Anna came over to join Peter. Um, this is a portrait of their in-laws, the Bayards. And this is the fairly well-known portrait of Peter Stuyvesant in the New York Historical Society probably based on a prototype made in the Netherlands um, and done by an artist called Henry Couturier. That's the latest thinking. Two others of Anna and her husband Samuel are currently in a private collection and are not well known. Indeed, the list goes on. Extant wills, inventories, I'm sorry, it's not quite what I wanted to do yet, uh, letters of the inhabitants of New Netherland, as well as many recently translated documents of the colony, make it quite clear that once the Dutch established themselves in the New World, they fairly quickly began to replicate their lifestyles they had left behind by filling their homes with luxury goods and that these goods included paintings. In the 1650s, records indicate there was a growing market for pictures in New Netherland. In her monumental study of Beverwijk, current day Albany, Yanni Venema found at least 72 paintings in the 14 auctions and 11 inventories she studied from that short lived city. Beverwijk is um, Albany, and it was called Albany from 1652 to, I mean, sorry, Beverwijk from 1652 to 64. In 64, the sale of Rutger Jakob's Beverwijk estate included six paintings two of which went to Peter Schuyler, a carpenter and gun stock maker who had arrived in the colony in 1650 and adapted quickly to a new lifestyle as a fur trader. He bought them for 100 guilders and 35 guilders. These were not in considerable sums. At the same sale, a silk wagon cover went for 97 guilders, a gold chain for 80 guilders, and a yacht for 259 guilders. In the 1640s, 100 guilders had been a yearly salary for a shoemaker. As I researched this material more and more, I noticed that many of the richest and most inter interesting collections belong to women. Margrethe van Varick's inventory, the focus of an incredible exhibition, I still say congratulations, <laughs> jointly curated by the New York Historical Society and the Bard Graduate Center in 2009, is a case in point. At the time, I took mental note of the high number of inventories of women that contained works of art, but did not specifically address the issue of gender in my subsequent essay. A change came in 2021 when at CAA, my colleagues Margaret Laster and Samantha Deutsch hosted a panel, panel chronicling lost legacies, women as collectors and dealers of the long 19th century. Margaret and Samantha referenced the change in women's legal status that took place during the 19th century in the US as a result of the New York Property Act of 1848. This act, which became the template for laws in other states, gave women more agency and control over their own lives and finances. Now free to inherit property and enter into contracts of their own accord, women began to collect works of art in their own names, not just under the cover of their husbands or other male relatives. The CAA session was designed to highlight how women, women have often been overlooked in the study of the history of collecting as their names and influence were historically hidden from view. 
Margaret and Samantha's panel made me want to revisit the collecting habits of the Dutch women of 17th and 18th century New Netherland and New York. Such a look, in fact, indicates that it is not at all surprising that the first Married Women's Property Act was enacted in New York State. Colonial Dutch women had historically enjoyed a legal stature that their sisters in colonial English settlements never did. Kim Tote and Martha Shattuck have pointed out that, quote, along with everything else that the Dutch brought to New Netherland, they firmly transplanted the Dutch legal system and its culture's acceptance of women's activity in trade and business. Yanni Venema's research found that, quote, wives undoubtedly influenced their husbands in making decisions and also served as business partners. Notarial papers illustrate women's involvement. There is no evidence that men considered this unusual or that they did not trust their wives. Women traded, bought goods at auction, sold at auction. A Dutch wife could own property. Although the rights of 17th and 18th century women of Dutch descent were not fully removed until New York gained its freedom from the British in 1783, ironically, um, during the 18th century, more and more families of Dutch descent began to follow the British custom of primogenitor when writing their wills. In The Women of the House, Jean Zimmerman depicts the slow loss of agency in a string of generations of women from the Phillips family, descended from the all-powerful powerful position held by she merchant Margaret Hardenbrock to the predicament Margaret's grandson's wife, Johanna, found herself in decades later when she was read her husband's will. Even though Joanna had come to their marriage with wealth of her own, her husband, Frederick Phillips II, had left her only a cash annuity. Quote, no houses free and clear, no warehouses, no salt meadows, no land at all. Although many traditional Dutch families may have been shocked at this, by 1751, it was totally accepted for a husband to convey less to a wife. It was the English way and the Phillips family was now governed by English custom. To most Americans, the fact that colonial Dutch women in New York had such power and agency is practically unknown, as is evidenced by the statement made about women at last year's CAA panel. And it made me revisit the concept of whether the women themselves may have collected the art and hence my research project here at Bard. For my talk today, I have divided the material I have been able to find in my fellowship into three parts. First, I will give an overview of the legal status of women in colonial New York, especially their involvement in trade. Second, I will discuss and evaluate the documentary evidence I have found for women as collectors and third, I will present a case study of the women of one particularly wealthy and influential colonial New York family, the Schuylers. The Dutch in New Netherlands generally abided by Roman Dutch law. Under this law, unmarried women would be treated as men and married women would enter into either a usus or a manus agreement with her husband. A usus marriage meant that a woman's dowry and estate would not become her husband's and that the husband did not have unlimited legal power over his wife. Also that a wife could trade, make contracts and sue in court. Under a manus marriage, a wife's property became her husband's, but he was also liable for her debts and protected her from the law. Generally, richer women, especially widows, would enter into usus agreements and less well-off women into manus agreements. Dutch women who entered into usus agreements with their husbands made good use of their ability to trade on their own. Not only did it give them agency, it was convenient for their partners who were able to rely on them to run their businesses when they were away, especially when they were at sea, as many were during the Dutch Golden Age. Dutch marriages were more often than not considered equal partnerships. Given this background, it's not surprising that in 1657, when the um, fathers of New Amsterdam first instituted a burger right, which was a system of municipal privilege that limited trade to those who had paid to receive the title, a woman, Rachel Van Tienhoven, widow of Cornelis, became one of only 20 to become a great burger by paying the required 50 guilders, quite a hefty sum. In addition, at least three women paid 20 guilders to become lesser burgers. Margaret Hardenbrock, matriarch of the Phillips family I mentioned earlier, is perhaps the best known and most successful of Dutch women merchants. 
While I have not so far found a reference to her specifically as a great burger, she is referred to in several documents as a free merchant of New Amsterdam. Coming from Amsterdam as a debt collecting agent for her cousin, Walter Volk, in the late 1650s, she married Peter Rodolphus Vries in 1659 and had one child, Maria. De Vries died in 1661 and Hardenbrock married Frederick Philipsa under a USIS agreement, which allowed her to maintain her legal identity and do business on her own. After the British took over the colony in 1664, Dutch women's rights were technically eroded, but initially in the Articles of Capitulation, there was a provision that the Dutch here shall enjoy their own customs concerning their inheritances. This was modified somewhat in the so-called Duke's Laws of 1665, but the Dutch were still generally allowed to continue their former practices. Margaret's career is a case in point. Despite the laws on the books, she continued to do business and own several houses and at least five ships, which according to a passenger on one in 1679 who wrote a journal, she ruled with an absolute iron fist. Margaret, it is clear, was instrumental in the wealth amassed for the Phillips of family that continued down for generations. It is Margaret Hardenbrook who provides us with one of the earliest uses of the term she merchant, which I have used in the title of my talk to refer to women traders. In a document filed in Dutch in 1664, Margaret gave power of attorney for her affairs to Trincher Willems, whom she referred to as a koopvrouw in Dutch, or she merchant or tradeswoman in English. Later evidence for the exact English term appears in 1734 in John Peter Zenger's journal. A group of widows wrote a letter to the editor in which they described themselves thus. We are housekeepers, pay our taxes, carry on trade, and most of us are she merchants. In the letter, which Jean P. Jordan believes could have been written by men who were unhappy with then Governor Cosby, um, the alleged women were complaining that while they paid taxes, they were generally ignored and did not receive the same benefits of men, such as being invited to dine at court. One might ask, how many of these she merchants were there in colonial New York? Jordan searched through advertisements and customs records from the period 1660 to 1775 and found at least 106 women that she considered merchants during this period. However, Jordan's definition of a merchant is someone who was able to import and export goods in bulk and sell them wholesale. If you include shopkeepers, artisans, and tavern keepers in a tally of she merchants in New York, the number of women active in trade generally would be much, much higher. The evidence for women of 17th and 18th century New Netherland, New York, as collectors not only of paintings, which I have focused on in my research so far, but of luxury items in general, lies in the rather sparse documentation from that time, including letters, but mostly consisting of inventories. The late historian of Dutch material culture, Ruth Piwank, a Dutch uh, American material culture, looked through over 350 New York inventories from the 1650s to the 1820s, for evidence of the material culture of the area and found that inventories before 1680 are rare and those in the period of New Netherland before 1664 even more so. This was the case even though the Duke's laws of 1665 expressly stipulated that a written inventory was to be made within 48 hours of the official inquiry into a death. Not surprisingly, given that an entire exhibition was devoted to it, one of the most extensive women's inventories from before 1700 seems to have been Margaret Van Barracks of 1696 at 18 pages long. And this is a page from the inventory with the transcription in English that's um, in the catalog. The inventory has detailed descriptions and valuations of over 654 items including textiles and trimmings, which Margarita sold as a shopkeeper, but also her household porcelain, furniture, silver, and paintings. The pictures take up nearly a fifth of the inventory of household goods. They include 22 paintings, among them a large horse battle, a fruit, and a landscape. And you can see letters R, S, and T for those items. 
In addition, it lists 12 prints and 14 East India pictures, an important distinction that indicates that pictures are not merely prints. And when I gave my talk on Dutch colonial paintings in the 17th century in New York, the um, idea was that, oh, these are just prints that are imported, but no, they actually were paintings, as this indicates. The total worth of the paintings in the inventory, 22 pounds, was 10% of the total worth of Van Varick's household goods. The inventory, sadly, does not give us an indication of where, when, and by whom they were purchased, although the horse battle, fruit, and landscape could be easily be by contemporary Dutch painters, um, such as a battle scene, a fruit, and a landscape. The East India pictures must have come from Malacca, now Malaysia, where Van Varick had traveled as an orphan with her uncle, a merchant, and at age 24, married Egbert Van Downs, also a merchant. After Egbert died in 1677, Margarita went back to the Netherlands with presumably many of the cotton and silk hangings and bedding that are found in her inventory. By 1679, she'd married her former minister from Malacca, Rudolphus van Varick, and they emigrated to Brooklyn in 1686, presumably again with all of Margarita's wares and household goods, as well as the collection of pictures. As yet, we have no record of whether Margarita or Rudolphus purchased the pictures, whether in Malacca or the Netherlands, or whether they had imported them once they arrived in Brooklyn. It is, however, entirely possible that Margarita herself had a hand in purchasing the artwork in her collection, as is, as is evidenced by the current research of Judith Norman of the University of Amsterdam, who's heading a nationally funded project in the Netherlands called The Female Impact, Women, the Art Market, and Household Consumption in the Dutch Republic, 1580 to 1720. At this year's CAA, Norman discussed her findings from the journals of two Dutch 17th century sisters, one married and one unmarried, that both show that show that both very actively commissioned artworks from local painters. In an essay in the catalog of the Van Varick exhibition, Piwanka studied the inventories of four other colonial Dutch women shopkeepers and compared them with Van Varick's. Although Margarita's is by far the most extensive, all had similar quality textiles and not a dissimilar similar number of picture frames most likely indicating a similar number of pictures. In my time at Bard, I plan to do further research to see if I can find other interesting inventories and also to determine, oops, whether the frames Piwanka mentions actually had pictures she didn't um, indicate in that she was uh, saying that uh, items were organized by type. So picture frames were part of the wood, of wooden objects in the inventories. Sarah Weber's had 19 picture frames. Christina, uh, Christina Capone's had 15, including, I did find, um, two Rosen pictures, one a ship, and one ye city of Amsterdam. Elizabeth Banker had 18, and Trincha Ahrens, who was a less successful trader and with a smaller inventory, had four pictures and four pictures ordinary. Ahrens, perhaps, is more comparable to the non-elite women in the Netherlands New Nether in the Netherlands, being studied by Lauren Smith, the di current digital art history fellow at the Frick Art Reference Library, who was working with the Montius database of 17th century Amsterdam inventories concerning art, containing art. Lauren, who just defended her dissertation on Friday, so congratulations, Lauren, if you're listening, presented a very interesting paper at CAA this month on non-elite women in the Montius database as collectors, buyers, and appraisers of art. Lauren found that individual women in the 1630s in Amsterdam were equally and sometimes more active in Amsterdam art in the Amsterdam art market as individuals than their male counterparts. One of the issues I have been running into as I'm working on my topic is what does it mean that these women owned and perhaps purchased a number of pictures? I think this issue tends to bedevil historians of collecting and the answer is not always clear cut. Does owning a number of pictures actually constitute a collection formed by a collector who was collecting? I have begun asking questions about, those of, uh, about this of those more deeply steeped in the field of collecting than I, and would be interested in hearing what the audience here has to say about it. 
However one defines these terms and whether they apply to the colonial Dutch, the fact remains that these women did amass a number of pictures along with many other luxury items. Why? It would seem there are two answers, for pleasure and for show. Despite displaying luxury items in your home was important to the social status of the family and the family business, both areas of concern to women. The wealthier the woman, the more likely she was to have a large collection of luxury items to display. However, my research shows that some of the wealthiest families had more interest in pictures than others, which indicates a choice was being made. Some have few to no pictures in their inventories, but others like the DePeisters and the Schuylers seem to have amassed collections that stood out to their peers and that are visible in extant portraits. Today, I will concentrate on the Schuyler women. The progenitor of the family was Philip Peters Schuyler, who, as mentioned, came over in 1650 and became one of the leading traders in Beverbite. Now, these portraits are probably not of those two, but there was a, 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 a rush to assign any random 17th century portrait to one of the forefathers of New York or, or some historical figure in the past when people were wanting to collect these things. So I have sincere doubts these are actually Peter and Margarita Schuyler. But anyway, um, Philip made a, um, sorry, Philip made a smart choice in marriage partners, marrying Margarita Van Slichtenhorst, who was the daughter of the director of the colony of Rensselaer White, the estate of the Van Rensselaer family. Philip Schuyler and Margarita were a successful couple and eventually owned a house in Albany, two homes and lots in New Amsterdam, a store building and a dwelling on a street near the East River. Also in, the, in Albany, they owned other houses on Broadway, State Street, Beaver Street and Pearl Street, as well as De Vlacht or the Flats, which Philip's, Philip purchased from Jeremiah Van Rensler in 1672. It became the family home for generations until it burned down in 1962. After Philip died in 1683, Margarita apparently, everyone has the same name too, they're all Margarita or Philip or Peter or Catherine. <laughs> um, after Philip died in 1683, Margarita apparently carried on Philip's business so successfully that when she died in 1711, she could state in her will that the property had greatly increased. From the inventory at her death in 1711, we learn that Van Slichtenhorst had a large house with 12 paintings, many more than just the two Philip had bought at the auction in Beverwijk in 1664 that I mentioned earlier. The inventory is in Dutch, and here's a copy of it. It's at the Albany Institute for History and Art. Um, it's in Dutch since Dutch remained the most common language in Albany well into the 18th century. It included three paintings hung in the large parlor, which seemed to have served as the main living space, as it included beds, tablecloths, curtains, porcelain, aprons, shoes, and clothing. In the entryway to the parlor, there were four paintings, a kas, or large wooden Dutch standing chest, and two chests with iron straps. And in the entryway to the other house, there were five paintings, a mirror, and dishes. Philip and Margarita's success carried over to their children, as did the desire to own real estate, furniture, and paintings, some of which they inherited from their parents, but some of which, as I will outline, they purchased on their own. This slide shows um, a family tree that is actively populated with commissioned portraits. Philip and Margarita's nine living children all married the other wealthy families of the colony. As Venema has outlined, this was a venerated Dutch custom as it consolidated wealth and power, thus setting up a dynasty lasting for centuries. And this is a slide I made from before, but it kind of gives you an idea of how for, um, it's, it's very uh, slimmed down just for some kind of clarity to sort of sh show you how they all married each other. The most well-known of Philip and Margarita's daughters was Alita Schuyler Van Rensselaer Livingston, in case you could have a more Albany Dutch name. Um, Alita was married at age 19 to her first husband, Nicholas Van Rensselaer, who had become the patroon of Rensselaer Wyke after the death of his brother, Jeremiah. After Nicholas's early death in 1678, Alita married Robert Livingston. 
the son of a Scottish preacher who had fled for, with his family to Rotterdam in 1664 and there learned fluent Dutch. In 1673, Robert immigrated to Boston and soon moved to Albany, flu fluent in Dutch and uh, English. Livingston was extremely useful to the Van Rensselaers as secretary and quickly rose to prominence in the Dutch community. He bought a house in Albany in 1675, married Alida in 1679, owned 3,800 acres by 1683, and by 1686 had been granted over 160,000 acres, all of today's Columbia County, by the English, who had accorded him the title Lord of the Manor. Obviously a very ambitious man, Robert was away from home a good deal of the time during his marriage with Alida. Luckily for us, Alida and Robert were extremely good correspondents and their letters back and forth over the years are a rich source of information. Like her mother, Alida was a highly capable businesswoman who was over the years able to manage the couple's vast resources, the 160,000 acres, bakery, brewery, gristmill, sawmill. The letters, which are now at Hyde Park, reveal many things about her activities keeping the estate alive independently negotiating the price of wheat, supervising millers, bakers, and brewers, and conducting trade with local Indians during her lengthy marriage. Native marriage, sorry. Clearly as her husband's equal partner. Although Alita left no will or inventory, several letters reveal her desire to own works of art. Unlike the woman studied by Judith Norman I mentioned er earlier, Alita went through her husband to purchase works of art. Not most likely because she was incapable of making deals, either in a legal or practical sense, although English law limiting women's legal status was beginning to exert itself more and more by this time. Um, in 1710, apparently a law was passed clarifying that married women with minors and the, uh, classifying married women with minors and those not sound of mind um, anyway, no, Alita was exempt from the legal strictures of English law because of her social prominence and her economic function in the colony. Instead, she most likely ordered paintings through Robert because she was essentially moored in place on their estate while he traveled extensively in New York, London, and other places where he had access to luxury goods. On both March 20th and 24th, 1698, Alita wrote Robert requesting he find her a painting for the space where the muskets were hanging. In a missive dated 26 October, 1717, Alita discusses changes she once made to a portrait that had been done of her, asking him to request the painter to make the dress less tight, the neck less bare, and the clothes darker. Sadly, no confirmed portrait of Alita exists. The one that they put up is too ridiculous, uh, late 19th century re redone portrait that they say is Alita, which is why I've only been sharing this portrait of Robert. Alita wrote Robert in 1720 to order from England two gilt frame paintings, one of two yards wide and one yard high, the other one and a half yards in width and the same length together with a flower pot or a still life. In another letter from 1721, she asked him to bring a painter to their house to paint a landscape for the fireplace, mantelpiece. According to Ruth Piwanka, Alida also supervised distribution of various artworks among the households of her children, acting almost like a present day curator. We do not know if Robert ever came through with her requests for paintings, but even today it is worth noting their descendants live in family houses with family portraits and heirlooms on parts of the former family manor in Columbia County, which indicates that Robert Livingston with his business partner, Alita Schuyler, established a very rare kind of long lasting dynastic wealth. This portrait attributed to Franz Hals descended in the Livingston family and was only sold recently at auction. Margrethe and Philip Schuyler's eldest daughter, Alita's sister Gertrude, um, married Stephen S. Van Cortland and lived in New York City. After Stephen's death in 1700, Gertrude continued on as an active trader, importing dry goods, Indian goods, and rum in 1703 and exporting furs to London in 1705. She also engaged in the timber trade. Nonetheless, in the inventory of her house taken in 1724, and I'm not sure that's not near her death date. I'm not, I have to look into why that inventory was taken. 
Um, none of this merchandise is listed, which is interesting in comparison with in inventory of Van Varick, which included her shop goods. Instead, Gertrude's inventory reflects a rather large 12 room house filled with material luxuries, including 17 pictures and 23 prints. Among other objects, Gertrude's main parlor itself contained nine pictures, an old clock and case, a tea table, a pair of dogs with brass knobs, a turkey carpet, and a black walnut sculpture, the only sculpture I have seen in an inventory so far. In general, Gertrude's inventory reflects a higher standard of living than her mother had in Albany or her sister along the Hudson River. Although I have not been able to trace the provenance back to Gertrude, it's not impossible she once owned this still life that appeared in her in grandson's inventory in 1814. And that's the very frustrating thing sometimes. You find a portrait or a landscape or a still life that was in one of these old Dutch families, but you can't make it go back to the 17th century. Um, other children of Margarita and Philip with an interest in pictures include the, their sons, Peter and Johannes, who both had marvelous portraits made of themselves. Johannes with his wife, Elsie Statz Wendell Schuyler, and Peter, who was mayor of Albany and commissioner of Indian affairs and was widely admired in the colony. This painting represents one of two known full length portraits created in the Hudson Valley before 1750. The other being of this very strong and independent woman, Arianta Coymans, who commissioned it from the artist after she received her inheritance from her father in the late 1640s and only married at age 51. In her late 40s, sorry, not 1640s. Um, Peter's son, Colonel Philip Schuyler, inherited his house in Albany and, quote, the costly furniture of the family of which paintings, plate, and china constituted the valuable part, as well as the flats in Colony, New York, near Albany. Philip, mar Philip married Johannes's daughter. So those two brothers I showed you, their, their children married each other. Uh, he married Margarita Schuyler in a true consolidation of Albany wealth, social status, and family. While I have little to no evidence so far of Margarita as a tradeswoman or collector, except the fact that I do know she inherited the portraits of her parents I just showed, she was by all accounts a formidable presence and considered, quote, at the center of the best society that Albany could furnish with claims that her society was positively cerulean and reportedly she entertained and even advised some British generals during the 1770s. She was known as Aunt or Madam Schuyler and seems to have commanded as much or more respect than many of her, her formidable merchant foremothers, if I can say that, reflecting the different standards for women that had arisen in the colony since the 17th century. Margarita, in fact, is the subject of a memoir written in 1808 by Anne McVicker Grant, a Scottish writer who spent her early childhood in Albany from 1758 to 68. The book, Memoirs of an American Lady, was written many years after the author's time in Albany and through the lens of the rose-colored glasses of an idyllic childhood, so it should not be read as a completely objective account, but nonetheless, her description of the rooms and furnishing of the flats are instructive. This house contained no drawing room. That was unheard of, an unheard of luxury. The winter rooms had carpets. The lobby had oilcloth painted in lozenges to imitate blue and white marble. The best bedroom was hung with family portraits, some of which were admirably executed. And in the eating room, which by the day was rarely used for that purpose, were some fine scripture paintings. Through the middle of the house was a very wide passage furnished with chairs and pictures. Valuable furniture, though perhaps not very well chosen or assorted, was the favorite luxury of these people. And in all the houses I remember of the Schuylers, the mirrors, the paintings, the china, were considered as the family teraphim, secretly worshiped and only exhibited on very rare occasions. Uh, Dr. Alexander Hamilton of Maryland uh, concurred with this view, uh, writing in his travel journal from 1744 when he visited Al the Albany Dutch, uh, among them no doubt the Schuyler family, that quote, they affect pictures much with which they adorn their rooms, 
the chief merit among them seems to be riches, which they spare no pains or trouble to acquire. So um, in the next uh, few months and probably after that, um, what I would like to do uh, this spring is to uh, look further into the inventories of Piwanka to, to, to see if uh, more on those um, the, the inventories that she worked on for the Van Varick exhibition. I'm also interested in working on um, finding ship manifests from the time because the pictures had to come back and forth um, bet between England and the Netherlands and New York. Um, there is a ship man manifest that's extant from one of Mar Margaret Hardenbrock's um, ships, which sadly didn't have any pictures on it, but that's one more uh, avenue for research. Um, um, there is, I, I would probably want to expand the study if I did to include the de Peister family. Um, Cornelia Lubbert's de Peister was a formidable tradeswoman woman who brought the first cargo of salt to Manhattan. And as mentioned, the de Peisters, um, whose house on Pearl Street was described by Benjamin Bullivant from Boston in 1697, um, as being richly furnished with hangings and pictures, um, most likely included these pictures, which are probably the best <laughs> Dutch pictures that I that have a strong provenance back to the 17th century for, um, by Michael van Moucher of two of their ancestors back in the Netherlands. So there's lots and lots to do. Um, I am going to uh, write a paper for the book that Margaret uh, Laster and Smet the Deutsch are um, getting together on colonial on, um, on on women as collectors and that will hopefully come out in a year or two and perhaps with all my interest in this area uh over the years something eventually like a book will come out but i'm not quite at that point yet, so thank you very long sorry <laughs> You want to take questions standing or sitting? I'll, I'll stand since we don't have any time. I didn't, I timed myself, but clearly I was slower. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. It's so interesting. I think we, yeah, it, it really enriches our picture of what was going on materially in this place hundreds of years ago. Um, I, uh, with an apology, my frame of reference is more Italian. So in relation to your question about whether dealing or owning a shop, you know, constitutes a collection. Um, I wonder if that's such an important, you know, distinction. And, and I think of like Sarah McPhee's work on Costanza Piccolomini, who was a great dealer and collector. And she, I mean, a totally different circumstance, right? Yeah. People roam, but she really points out that the dealing, it was, it, there was no clear cut distinction in the sense that these were furnishings of their elegant home, which you could be invited into and some of them were for sale. And so, I mean, I think they could function in both ways. Okay. And I, I just wonder if a version of that model couldn't apply also. I think so. It's, a, it's a sort of a question that sort of, as I said, bedevils me, bedevils people sort of, you know, especially when you get inherited portraits and all of that kind of thing. But there's, there's, there's less of a mark for... Um, in any case, selling suggests yeah. that there's a collecting market yeah, in this exactly. place. Yeah, so I, yeah. anyway, I just was wondering about that. And then the, the last thing you left us with is quality questions. And obviously these we would consider you know, <laughs> good pictures. And a lot of what you showed would be considered pretty crappy pictures. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I'm reminded of an Italian context, Patrizia Cavazzini's um, book on painting as business, I think, in 17th century Rome. And she just makes the point that our whole view of what paintings were in this culture and who owned them is completely distorted by what survived, right? right, so. right. And what survives, there's a, there's a quote from 1679 about how all the Dutch pictures are up in the attics because they're not fashionable anymore. And I think a lot of them just disappeared. Yeah. So that's sort of what I was, what I was wondering is, can you add to your project, you know, that, that lens? Um, because I guess throughout your talk, I was trying to picture these houses, you know, the flats obviously is like a pretty fancy house, but I was trying to picture what I know of the arrangement of Dutch, of, of portrait of pictures, sorry, in Dutch, you know, uh, metropolitan, urban, relatively wealthy homes with how they would, how they would be in these rather small, you know, dark colonial wooden houses that have different plans, you know, aren't the same. So I was just trying to think, is it also then accompanied with a radical ratcheting down of quality level? And is that one reason that you can't 
trace these things because they've decayed. I mean, Cavazzini's point is that we don't have them part because they weren't thought re- worthy of preservation, but also because they were painted thinly on crappy materials and they were probably at the end of their useful lifetime when the original owners died. So I just wonder about that. If, no, if the I, values given can give you any sense of the perceived quality or... Well, I mean, Ben Barrack's inventory, they're all like two pounds or something right, like that. Tracks with... Right, but then you have the one that Peter Schuyler buys in 1664 for 100 guilders, which, you know, I tried to show based on, you know, other costs of other items that was quite a bit of money. So what was that? Um, and, and, and as, as I said, these are definitely the best I found. And most of them, you can't even tell what they are because a portrait, a landscape, or in uh, Jakob de Lange's inventory, there's like, you know, pomegranates and fruit and this and that. A picture. They're just which suggests picture. that it's not worth much if they're not. Right. I mean, the other thing is it, it's sort of, well, it's, it was interesting. I did a study of the difference of the worth of um, the paintings in the Matias database. So you're talking in Amsterdam in the 17th century, it goes through 1680 though, um, with the ones here. And there's just not as many here, obviously, but it's not, I mean, it, yes, it's a whole lot worth a whole lot less, but in terms of the average person, let's say in the Matias database, it's not that different. So you're just talking the big collectors are buying Rembrandt, they're buying Vermeer, they're buying Hals, they're buying this over there, but also, in the Dutch 17th century, they also have every baker and brewer. There's some English travelers who go over there and they all have, you know, pictures too, which is more like these people who were nobody when they came over. So they're kind of trying to recreate, a, you know, a situation. Um, and, and, you know, during the, the, I mean, during this period, you start having really good American portraitists like, you know, Copley and um, even Wollaston or somebody like that sort of starts coming up in this period and the, the level of American painting gets better and better. But it's not like they just didn't buy or have anything. They really did. I don't know. It just was a, sort of something that's been, <laughs> it's a very frustrating project in some ways because there's so little that exists that you can trace. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so I was thinking, so we had a conversation a few weeks ago, and I was thinking, hearing the formal presentation of it, um, again, how much it might change the way you think about what collecting is to look at things other than paintings, and right. the, the kind of bias about uh, right. from an art <laughs> historical a little bit of that. <laughs> right, like you, the mention of China and, and furniture and sculpture, obviously, is something else that's interesting, you know, but but things that were worth that, that had high value. And it's, it's possible that the paintings, because they were bad or because they were um, local, that didn't have as high value as things like the China, which probably were first imported um, at this point, either, you know, probably Chinese porcelain right. Um, right. or, you know, textiles, the carpets that were Turkish, you know, these, these might've actually been worth a lot more money than the paintings. Yeah, I think that that's so, possible. And and I, since we talked, I sort of tried to, you know, think about that more in general, trying to look at it more. It's, as, as you pointed out, I have a, just a bias towards painting just from my art historical background. You see now, so we're I know. Out. So it's, this is kind of a mind switch for me that I have to make. So it's, it's, it's you give me a month or two. I mean, the inventory should actually say how what the what the relative values are, and that would be a place. Well, to not start. all the inventories have values, so right. And um, you know, I tried to you know I I added up what Margarita's in terms of her household goods. I didn't compare it with the china and with the fabrics either. Yeah, actually, but <laughs> that is what we go. <laughs> So you, you mentioned the letters, which seem like they're a rich source of, of information. And did you, did you find, other than her wanting to have the painting repainted and adjusted, what did you, is there um, information that's revealed that's other than transactional about their relationship to objects? Because there are a lot of lists that you use, you know, to sort of kind of Put it all together, but did they get even? Do they get specific in letters about their relationship to objects that give you clues? Um, you know, in, in terms of actually the number of references to paintings, which just seems like a lot, and I listed them all next to the uh, 
quantity of their letters. It's, it's really, it's actually pretty minimal. Um, and I, and I think it's somewhat, um, transacting, like I want to have a painting over the fireplace. It's not, um, so no, I would say no with, with her and the others I've only had the, um, <clears throat> I've only had the, uh, the um, evidence from the inventories, which obviously don't show you much at all, except for, you know, where they're placed in the home and seems to be the bigger ones and the better ones. And in the inventory, some of the inventories do go room by room, but others don't like Margarita Van Barracks goes to object type by object type. Um, so all the paintings you saw were listed on the same page. Um, so, no, there's nothing like I would like this picture because except for that one thing about her dress, you know. So it's it's a frustrating. I mean, that's that's the great thing about, you know, even from the 19th century up, there's just way more information that's that's possible. Although I've heard plenty of talks talking about we don't know why this person, you know, bought this <laughs> work of art or what they thought of it. Even Henry Clay Frick, you know, it's always kind of a little frustrating. We don't really know like why he purchased this or that. But he, and with all the archives, I mean, every piece of toilet paper that he bought is like in the archives, you know, <laughs> practically. So it it just depends on the collector and the, the record that survives, yeah. Hi, thank you, Brisa. I was wondering, and this is a, just a, a small question. Um, I'm thinking about comparing the uh, inventories that you find in in the, in New York with uh, inventories in the Spanish Americas. In, in a lot of cases, in most cases, you don't really find any descriptions of paintings in the Spanish colonial um, environment. So I was I was wondering if, if that's a common practice to have inventories, like very detailed inventories with the description actually of the paintings or they're about. You may use say horses or whatever. Is that something that can also um, say something about the value of the paintings? It says more about um, the the notary who did the inventory and their interest in the thing. You know, like you saw some of them were just like 12 pictures, you know, like the East India pictures. I don't know what those are, or prints, you know, are they just the old city of Amsterdam or are they portraits of the king? You know, they don't say, and so it really does. It, I've never seen like a print that's been described. So in that sense, you could say yes, because some of them have these minimal descriptions like a landscape or a pomegranate with, you know, whatever, something. And that's really nice to have. But it, um, so I think it depends a lot on who took the inventory and you just don't know from one to the other. Yeah. Um, okay. In the Dutch ones, in the, in the Montes database, so they're, they're somewhat similar. It's sort of like a ship or this or that. I mean, they have a lot of objects to go through, you know, like Margarita Van Barrick had 694 objects. So they went pretty fast. In the Spanish colony ones, they don't even say that they're paintings or? They say they're paintings, but they don't say anything about the paintings. Yeah. They say the painting in a gilded frame with blah, blah, blah. I mean, they're describing yeah. the frame. Yeah. Do you think size? Because I mean, that's typical no. of European inventories. No. Yeah. I know that would be so nice. It justifies the value in a sense, but yeah, okay. Yeah. But Although not. Alita ordered the one which is a yacht, I don't know if she yeah. got it though. <laughs> but also, if they have like the comparison between the description of the paintings, if there is any uh, versus the description of something else in the same inventory, can tell you something about. That's true too. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's demonstrably different than the description of something else. Mm -hmm. Say an old China teacup with. Rose design or something like that, which is sort of the same descriptive level, I would say. There's never anything really wrong. I think they wanted to go in and get, you know, it was just sort of, you know, so. it's not like a Sotheby's interview. I mean, um, oh, I spilled all over there. Uh, you know, a, an appraisal. It is an appraisal, actually, but it's not. Thank you so much for your talk. My, my question uh, goes in the direction of uh, Jeffrey's question. Maybe I have missed something, so I apologize. But um, in fact, what is a collection? And I was thinking about in inventories. And uh, there were inventories of objects, of properties, of furnitures. And why do you think that the inventories are not only um, a list 
of uh, household and uh, which is really important for uh, for people and for housekeeping and for budgeting and, and do you consider the inventory as a collection and if i think at europe at the time it's not only the pleasure to collect is um, the um, prestige question and the objects are displayed so and what is the difference between this the display object and maybe used objects, which is not a part of collection. And at least, what is your concept of collection here? Um, it seems maybe they are objects they lived by or um, something in between. And I think the, the portraits, at least I have a photo album of my family, but I don't consider that a collection. Well, that was like, well, that's what I'm saying. That's sort of yeah. question is some people, I mean, these are just, a lot of these are inventories taken at the point of death, right? That was a legal thing that needed to happen. And so, it, yeah, is it a collection? Now, on the other hand, there was one Schuyler, the Gertrude Schuyler woman who lived in New York, and that, in, and I have to, that's something to look, I have to figure out. Her inventory was taken in 1724. She didn't die until the 30s. So why was that taken? That's interesting because it's not, you know, a, just a death inventory. And is it a collection? Yeah, I, this is the question that I have that, you know, um, but they had to have purchased these things for a particular reason. And I don't, I mean, you could say like, um, you could say that, you know, a Medici or something had a collection, but it, in some ways I'm looking at it as a measure of wealth. I mean, you know, the, uh, people, why do people, anybody collect, buy anything? They want to display them. They want to show social status. They like them. I mean, the, the reasons are ultimately the same. Some people collected more, some people collected less. And, and, and even with these patroon families in the Hudson Valley, some of them didn't really collect pictures at all, which I found interesting, you know? So why do some of them collect pictures and some of them don't collect pictures? So that shows a preference or a choice. So, um, and, and, but I mean, Jeffrey was saying, is that, does it quite matter? I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, Much more interesting to not consider the whole items as a, a closed collection, but to consider them as, object of belonging or cultural um, identity, I don't know, but maybe it's much more interesting to consider that as a collection in a classical um, meaning of the term. So I'm going to jump in. Do you have a, a term you would like us to use? Like, the, What's a post-collection <laughs> term? Like what's the next generation of scholarship that processes your right. question? and finds a word for it. It's maybe something like an assemblage. Mm -hmm. uh, the object they lived with, uh, with several, several meanings, several uses. Maybe they used the objects. It's not a part of a collection in a Pomian meaning. And yes, an assemblage. I so because if you think family portraits are a very interesting example, because family portraits wouldn't necessarily have value yes. to anybody else. There's no, no obvious art market for family portraits, regardless of quality. So, you know, if you have family portraits, should they be considered, if we use that as a diagnostic tool, they're much closer to objects of use. The use being, in this case, the stimulation of memory or uh, piety than they are to objects typically collected. Anyway. But also just, not a landscape or a battle or a still life that, you know, they don't really fit in. Um, the <laughs> studies of collections like the early Fugger in the 16th century, who were collectors of paintings, for sure. But when you look at actually what they collected, and we do know, so it's handy, um, they were portraits, which they clearly yeah. collected for dynastic reasons, you know, family, apparent. The, the, the English, you know. But they had also um, history paintings or battle scenes, which again sort of reflected a certain aspiration to martial prowess. So, so the, they are, the, the, 
you can't really speak of their, their paintings as a collection in any kind of aesthetic, mm -hmm. you know, for, for aesthetic reasons and so on, but you can see them as speaking to the values that the family want to project. And right. I just wonder if there's any kind of equivalent you could, apart from the portraits, of course. I um, think that that is actually more what they were I mean, doing. the landscape you mentioned is very interesting. One, that it's commissioned by a local. It's not an imported Dutch painting. Right. And the second one, that it's over a mantelpiece, which, again, is that a pointing to land ownership or to, you know, so, you know, there's all kinds of interesting cultural values you might be able to tease out of that kind of So, thing. Andrew, is it, is it a collection or is it branding? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I, I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a slightly anachronistic term, but yes, you're right. It's a form of familial branding. It's here I am. These are my values. And portraits, I mean, you know, you have... Um... Nicholas Rutz is a fur trader in 17th century Amsterdam, and he wanted to advertise the fact that he was a successful fur trader, so he had Rembrandt who then he came to portrait yeah. um, you know, on purpose, so that he can then display it in the shop and say, you know, I'm a successful. Yeah. So it's branding, you know. Also, if Bronzino paints your portrait, it is valuable. I mean, you know, or Leonardo or something. It, it, I think... Even if you don't know the person, it's painted by, uh, it's a great portrait, it doesn't really matter. And there are plenty of examples, you know, museums are full of portraits by of people we don't know who they are. Well, I wonder if that speaks to the branding question, because to have, you know, to have a portrait by a famous artist is a way of saying I am an important person. Right, at that moment it is, but then it, its value is retained because of, because of the, the qualities of the object, not because of its familial. No, no, it's because of the famous artist who does it. Right. Right. I have, we, we're at our time, but I, we have a bunch of questions from the, uh, the audience, so I'm just going to throw them at you. Basically, they, they fall under three categories. So one is um, Michelle Major, one of our faculty members, asks about a couple of specific people. Um, uh, another attendee, Anonymous, wants to know about uh, people of color who appear in family portraits? Are there servants or Native, Native Americans, indigenous people who show up? And then there are a couple of questions focusing really on colonial, the contrast between different colonial North American collecting practices. Do any distinguish, let's say, the Dutch um, from the English? And there's a comment that um, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich long ago wrote that in uh, 17th century New England, actual arrangements between wives and husbands differed considerably from the legal stipulations. And there, she, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, uses the term deputy husbands to refer to women who could act with, uh, on their own initiative. So um, are the col colonial collecting practices different enough to identify the communities of collecting? You mean between the Dutch and the and the English? Let's and say. let's say the French in other parts of North America, um, or the Spanish further along. I I did before look more into the, the English collecting practices, and they are not substantially different, which goes against my hope that um, <laughs> the Dutch, because of their particular um, background in the 17th century. Um, although I would say overall, the number of inventories that appears in, I mean, the number of paintings, since I was focusing on paintings, that appears in New England inventories and let's say Maryland inventories is less than in New York. So there does seem to be a little bit of a correlation there between national um, origin um, and the collecting practices. Um, and women traders here were also, there's also that phrase of, of deputy, deputy husbands that comes up a lot. Um, and the law actually was, I was trying to emphasize that the law was the English law here, but um, they, the, the English were just very lenient with the Dutch um, the whole way and sort of let them continue to trade. That's why Margaret Hardenbrock kind of got away with what she got away with. Um, and Alita Livingston and, you know, they, they continued to be able to do, to do, to, to trade legally and be quite active. I think because the colony needed them, you know, economically it was, it was significant. It was important to have the women active in the trade to get the wealth going in the families. And once, um, 
they became rich enough. They didn't need that as much. Um, you know, that's why the, the, the Phillips, the women, and then the Schuyler, the Livingston women, et cetera, the Schuyler women, you know, by the 1750s were sitting around, they were supposed to, you know, have teas and dances and things like that. That was their function in society by then. So. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, our audience in the room uh, and those in the ether. And, uh, and we look forward to hearing more from you over the course of your time at the BGC this semester. Thank you. <laughs>